People go nuts over nuts. They are so tasty. They are so easy to overeat, though, which is a problem because they're also loaded in fat. So what can we do to keep our nut cravings under control? That's what we're going to find out today. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. We appreciate you all joining us to help make the world a healthier place. So nuts are indeed nature's protein powerhouse. You got some essential nutrients in there. You've got some minerals in there. You got some vitamins in there. The problem is, as we said, they are little fat bombs. And man, you know, just handful after handful. It's so easy to keep eating these. And don't get me started on peanut butter, right? How many of us spread on an ultra thick layer every single time we make toast or make a PB&J? I don't know. It just seems half the jar send, uh, tends to disappear. So today we're going to get our nuts under control, really. That's what we're going to do. And the man who's going to help us do all of that is Dr. Neil Barnard. He is here to talk about how to not overdo it, what the proper portion size looks like. Is there a healthiest nut? Which one should we be gravitating towards? And is it possible to lose weight and still eat nuts at the same time? We're going to find that out as well. Plus, we're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag. So if there's something that you would like to ask Dr. Barnard about nuts or really anything else related to your health, go ahead, post that in the comments or in the chat, and we will get to as many questions as we possibly can here on the show today. And with that, we do welcome our good friend, the author of Your Body in Balance, Dr. Neil Barnard, back to the exam room live. My friend, good to see you. Good to see you. All right. You know, nuts. Why are they so doggone addictive? I mean, I've struggled with this really my entire life, and I don't keep peanuts in the house for this very reason. It's just handful after handful after handful, and before you know it, that jar is gone. You are not alone. Uh, they have some characteristics that make them especially appealing. One is that they're salty. The other is that, as you mentioned, they're, they're pretty high in fat. And just about anything that's really salty and fatty is going to grab you. Think about potato chips. Think about French fries. Think about onion rings. Nuts are in that category, the fatty, salty stuff. Our brains are actually hardwired to seek these things, and we do get hooked on them, which means you're not physiologically addicted, but you will crave them and you'll miss them when they're gone. That said, there are a lot worse things that you can get hooked on because nuts do have some benefits too. Outstanding. Um, and we actually have a question from somebody talking about cheese and breaking cheese addiction. We're going to get to that, spoiler, in just a little while. Um, but let's talk about a proper serving size for nuts. Uh, the last time you were on the show, this came up kind of in passing, and, and the person was like, you guys always talk about this, and you just say, well, you know, about a handful. But what does an actual portion size of nuts look like? What's just the right amount? Well, I think it depends on who you are and what your goals are, because if your goal is to lose weight, your portion size is zero. And the reason I say that is for, for now, while you're trying to trim down, if you have nuts in your routine in any substantial amount, it's like any other fatty food in your routine. Every fat gram has nine calories, as everybody who watches the exam room knows. Every fat gram has nine calories in it. That makes them the densest source of calories. And that means it's harder and harder to lose weight. In our research studies, when people are doing a plant-based diet and they feel like they're keeping oils really low, but somehow they're just not losing weight, what we always do is we ask them to write down everything that they've eaten in the course of the day, and we look through it to see what contraband there might be in there. <laughs> and it's, it's usually either nuts or a nut butter or sometimes guacamole or something like that. And people will say, well, that's good fat, isn't it? Yeah, but that good fat has those good calories in it, just like um, any kind of fat. So uh, if you are trying to lose weight, or if, frankly, if you're trying to reverse diabetes, if you're trying to tackle hot flashes, I would suggest that now is the time to set the nuts aside. Don't have them. Um, on the other hand, let's say you're healthy, thin, you don't have health issues that you're trying to tackle. At the, for a person who's in that category, I would say maybe an ounce a day would be a reasonable amount. And the reason I say it's a reasonable amount is that it brings you the nutrition, the nutrition that nuts provide, especially vitamin E. Vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin. So it's in the foods that have that good fat in them. And so that's a good thing. An ounce is something that won't mean anything to you um, typically. So to make that concrete, what you could do is put some nuts into the palm of your hand. And if it has hit your fingers, that's more than an ounce. So the amount that fits comfortably right into the center of your palm, that's it. 
And, and then the other thing, Chuck, let me just mention this really quickly. Um, I think you, you hit on it, that once that hand goes to your mouth, we fill our hand again. And so we want it, you know, until the, the bag is empty or whatever. So what I suggest you do is don't really use them as a snack food, use them as a flavoring. So crumble that handful up and put them on your salad uh, or something like that so that you're using the nuts as a flavor, not as a primary snack food, because our little weak willpower is, is uh, not going to do it when it comes to nuts. Uh, willpower is a joke when it comes to nuts. And look, uh, we actually have a visual aid today. So you mentioned an ounce of nuts. This is uh, sunflower seeds. I got this right before we started taping today. This is one ounce of sunflower seeds. And as you say, like fit it right into the palm of your hand. That's about it. This is like one handful. And you can see that's about as far as it goes. Perfect for a salad topper. But I mean, imagine, as you said, you're eating this as a snack. This is going to be gone in two bites. And you're going to want to eat more and more and more that whole container right now that's sitting in the pantry, uh, not just this one out serving right here. Um, we have a question from Valerie. And, you know, there are 18 million different varieties of nuts out there. In your opinion, is there one that is healthier than another or is that kind of, well, just go with the ones that you like? From a fat content uh, side, they're all about the same. Um, if you look at even peanuts, which are an honorary nut, you know, they're a, they're a legume, they're in the, in the bean family, but their fat content makes them very much like almonds and cashews and others. Um, th th there's one, ex or really two exceptions, chestnuts and water chestnuts. Yes, if you roast them uh, on your fire in the, in, in the wintertime, those chestnuts do not really have very much fat at all. So knock yourself out with them. But for the others, the fat content is about the same, but the fat type is not exactly the same. So here, I'm going to say cashews are a little on the creamier side because their saturated fat content is slightly higher than, say, almonds, where almonds are fatty like other nuts, but the oil in them is less saturated. What does that mean? Uh, that means a person who is trying to make, uh, say, a vegan cheese is going to make it out of cashews because they're creamier. A person who really just wants the healthy vitamin E is going to pick almonds. Okay, uh, here's an interesting thing. You're talking about, you know, the oils and nuts. And a lot of times in the roasting process, oil is added and that may up the fat content. So Blakely is wondering whether dry roasted is always the best option. Yeah, it sure is. And uh, a, a dry roasted one doesn't have those calories added. Hey, I'll do you one better. Have it in the shell. Um, I'll do you one better than that. Have it on the shell in the tree. Uh, that's, that's, that's what nature had in mind. So, you know, we think, well, nuts, they're natural, but they're so fattening. The reason is in nature, they were in a shell. It was hard to open them up. They were seasonal. So you didn't have them all around. Nobody pureed them and put them into a jar and they didn't cook them and salt them to make them absolutely irresistible. So nuts were not a huge part of our diet or anybody's diet. Really. Um, it's a, a seasonal kind of food that's kind of hard to access. So it's technology that has made all those calories so available to us now. You know, right before the show, I hopped on, uh, I, I will say it's a famous peanut company and their mascot happens to be a peanut with the monocle. And that's all I'm going to say about that. And I flipped it over. I was like, okay, well, Valerie or Blakely here has a really good question about adding oil and salt. And what does that do to the nutrition content, right? So you, you flip it over. What I found particularly interesting here, and this is just me being completely skeptical, I want to take a closer look at these numbers to see if they're actually accurate. The dry roasted unsalted peanuts here, that one ounce serving you were talking about, 14 grams of fat, two uh, grams of saturated fat, but only five milligrams of sodium, right? So that's dry roasted unsalted. But then when you get into what they call the classic or cocktail peanut, they do add that oil, they do add uh, that salt, but on the nutrition label, it said that the fat content was still the same. The only difference was that they added a hundred milligrams of sodium per serving. So I'm curious, like, I just don't see any way in the world. This is just skeptical Chuck talking for myself here. I don't see any way in the world that if you add oil to a process that that fat content is not going to go up. So what is the process for these nutrition labels? That, that just doesn't seem to equate to me. Yeah, well, I, I think you're right. I mean, if, if you're adding oil, obviously the lipid content is, is going to go up. But on the other hand, in their defense, most of the fat, the vast majority of the fat is in that nut. 
whether it's dry roasted or, or roasted with oil. So, so it's the nut itself that, that has that oil in it. Again, not an entirely bad thing. It's a good source of vitamin E and so forth, but it is uh, loaded with calories and it's going to make any oil related issue that much worse. Um, I mentioned menopause. I mentioned people want to reverse diabetes or lose weight. One other group I'd add to this is there has been uh, some research lately on uh, dysmenorrhea, meaning garden variety menstrual cramps. And young women often feel dramatically better when they go to a plant-based diet if they also keep the oils really low. If you're on a vegan diet, but it's filled with oils, then it's almost as bad as the meat-based diet with regard to the, the, the monthly symptoms. Let's uh, switch gears, talk uh, really quickly about some nut butters. Uh, I think that this probably the same principle applies, uh, what we were talking about, the different varieties of nuts and their health benefits. Millie is wondering what type of nut butter is the best to purchase. Mm. Read the label. Um, if it's almond uh, butter, for example, that's fine. You really can't go wrong with it. But what you will discover is sometimes that's not just what's in the jar. To make it creamier, they'll add palm oil, which is very commonly added nowadays to uh, almond butter, peanut butter, other types too. Sometimes they'll add uh, hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils. So your best choice is the one that is the nuts. That's it. Yeah, it's funny, you know, you flip over some of those jars of peanut butter too. They've added things like, you know, sugar in addition to the oil or molasses I've seen in some varieties. Um, it's it's not just that natural peanut butter there. Um, we have an interesting question from Vanessa here, uh, Vanessa Poindexter. This one came in at 12.07. Uh, we've talked recently about fat actually uh, affecting blood sugar levels. Vanessa is wondering specifically whether nuts can affect blood sugar levels. Yeah, in theory, there's no reason that they wouldn't. Now, researchers have actually tested this. And for those of you who have been following us for a while, um, you know about what I'm going to say. If you're new to this, this might be surprising. When you eat fatty foods, the fat particles get into your cells, your muscle cells, your liver cells, and that makes your insulin have difficulty getting your sugar into that cell. Your insulin is like a key. It comes from the pancreas attaches to the surface of your muscle cell or your liver cell. And it happens to open, it, it has to open that cell up to let the sugar come out of the, get out of the blood into the cell. If that cell is filled with fat from the foods you've eaten, the insulin's not going to work while you're insulin resistant. This happens very, very rapidly. Now, the good news is that with nuts, it can still happen, but it is somewhat less likely than if you were to have a food that's really high in saturated fat. That can be dairy products, that can be meat products, or something like coconut or palm oil. Those oils will cause insulin resistance much more predictably than the, the more um, the healthier, low saturated fat vegetable oils. All right. I think that Jessica here has a real, real, real fondness for nuts. This is this is a hypothetical from Jessica. I don't know if she's trying to game the system here, Dr. Barnard, but this question definitely makes me laugh. She says, okay, well, in terms of, of weight loss or maintaining weight, what if you were tracking your calories, you eat the appropriate amount of calories, but half of them are coming from nuts? Will you, in fact, still lose weight? That's funny. The answer is yes, you will, you will still, this is still lose weight. A calorie is still a calorie and the, and no matter what you eat, you're not going to change the laws of thermodynamics. So if, and, and I am not re uh, recommending this, but if you decided that you were going to eat no more than 1400 calories a day, kind of no matter what they were from, you would, you would lose weight. And the difference would be rather small if it was uh, calories from one source or another, there are some differences, but, but not huge problem with nuts and, and researchers have done exactly this study. They'll, they'll bring in folks and they'll say, okay, let's see what happens to your weight. Now have some nuts every day, just as part of what you eat. And what you typically find is that when people do that without consciously compensating, they gain weight. If you take that very same person and you say, have some nuts, but I want you to take out the same number of calories that you're adding, you don't gain any weight. Or if you take a person and you say, eat nuts, but drastically cut your calories, you're going to lose weight. But all of those are really artificial scenarios. The typical scenario in real life is you decide, should I have some nuts or should I have an apple as my afternoon snack or a banana or something? The fruit is really low in fat. It's very low in calories. It's got water. It's got fiber. It fills you up. You lose weight. 
the nuts, unfortunately, as delicious and many in many ways helpful as they are, are they are a little calorie bomb. And so they're going to tend to cause weight gain. Wouldn't somebody who's uh, making up so much of their diet from one type of food, wouldn't they also be running the risk of missing out on all of the other nutrients that they need because you don't have that that variety in your diet? So you're going to get all of those essentials that you need. Yeah, I, I, your point is, is really a good one um, because nuts are so fatty. Um, you're you're first of all, you're losing just the healthy, complex carbohydrate that runs your body. That's that's the fuel your body's really looking for. Um, and you want to have plenty of room for the fruits and the vegetables and the vitamins that they're going to bring you. I want to say hi to uh, Andrena, who's watching us in Western Oklahoma, joining us live for the very first time. Thank you so very much for being here. I appreciate that. Um, we have a couple of people right now wondering if there's a connection between uh, eating nuts and lowering cholesterol. Have you seen any studies to that effect? David Jenkins at the University of Toronto, who is a great genius, and he's been a, a real friend to the work we've doing, that we're doing. In 1981, he invented the glycemic index. Very helpful. Um, and, it, and it's widely used to rate uh, healthier carbohydrates, for example. But then after that, he did another study that was um, really influential. He said, what if I bring in people? They got high cholesterol. They want to lower it. And what if we do a plant-based diet, but wait a minute, a plant-based diet with certain foods emphasized. And he called it a portfolio diet because he was throwing into this diet a portfolio of special foods, soy products or other products that are high in soluble fiber like oats. And one of the things he tested was almonds. And what he found is that you do get a little extra added benefit. So he was able to bring cholesterol levels down really fast. Um, within a month's time, you saw this dramatic reduction in cholesterol, the kind of thing that you might take a statin for. He could do it easily with just the portfolio diet. So you don't need a lot of, of nuts to do it. The amount that we've been talking about will work. And the ones that he would have relied on probably would be almonds. People have done the same kind of thing with, with walnuts and some others as well. It's not a, an enormous uh, cholesterol lowering, but it's, it's there and you'll see it. You know, so many people right now uh, are talking about uh, being a peanut butter junkie. I'm just going back and I'm reading these comments and and that seems to be like the number one thing that people struggle with. Um, I, I guess like because you're you're putting so many peanuts and you're just kind of squishing them down, uh, and you can really overdo it. I think that the typical serving size for a nut butter is two tablespoons. But again, right, like who takes the time, Dr. Barnard, to measure out two tablespoons every time that they're spreading it on a piece of bread? Uh, is nut butter something that you would recommend somebody be especially cautious with in terms of portion size? It can certainly be part of a healthy diet. But what you'll discover for a lot of people when they reflect they, when they were little and their mom made them a sandwich or their dad made them a sandwich, it was a little smear of peanut butter and some jelly or some sliced banana, or, and that was it. And then when you were able to take the, the, the table knife into your own hands, because you're now a college sophomore or something like that, you, you, you unscrew the jar. And between that and your table knife, that's lunch. You know, you dig, you dig in and you've got a huge amount. So, so you're, yes, what you're saying, that, that is the problem. And people, people will feel it and you'll see the results on the scale. No doubt about it. All right. Uh, keep those nut questions coming, but let's go ahead and, and broaden things up. Let's broaden up the discussion, take some other questions right now that are sitting in the mailbag. So we talked about uh, the addiction to nuts, the struggle there. Let's talk about another very, very, very common food addiction. And that one, of course, is cheese. And Huck is struggling right now, Dr. Barnard. Uh, Huck is looking for your advice on what he might want to try to overcome this cheese addiction. Oh, you are not alone. Uh, and, and first, let me make sure that everybody knows why this happens, because there's some um, comfort in knowing that it's not a bad childhood or, or weak willpower that led you to get kind of hooked on cheese. What it is, is partly what we've been talking about. Cheese happens to be fatty and very salty. There, there is more salt in an ounce of cheese than there is in an ounce of potato chips. So it's very salty, very fatty. That makes it addicting. But the secret ingredient in all cheese products is what are called casomorphins. The casein protein, that's the main protein in dairy, it's uh, broken down in your digestive tract. And as it breaks down, it releases chemicals that the cow made 
called casomorphins. They're morphine-like compounds. They go to the mu receptors on your brain, just like heroin would, and they attach there. And they have about one-tenth the brain binding power compared to pure pharmacy-grade morphine. And they have a narcotic effect. So it's not dramatic. You're not going to um, get arrested for this. But on the other hand, it is strong enough to get you hooked. So there are traces of it in milk. There are traces of it in ice cream. But when people make cheese, that concentrates the casomorphins. And it causes people then to like everything about cheese. Um, even though it smells like old socks, they, they are, they're hooked on this stuff. So they interpret all those things rather generously after that point. Problem, very high in salt, very high in cholesterol, very high in exactly the worst fat for your brain, saturated fat. And the beauty of this is that once you really look at what's in cheese, what it took to get it on your plate, uh, the environmental impacts, what happens to the animals, all of those considerations, cheese ends up being kind of on everybody's bad list. And, and when it is, and when you set it aside, people discover that weight loss and reaching their health goals is so much easier. How long does it take for somebody when they, they take that out of their diet? How long does it usually take for them to kind of get over that cravings hurdle? You know, everybody's a little bit different. With, with meat, we have found that people forget about meat very quickly, surprisingly quickly. When you bring in people and you're, you're putting them on a plant-based diet as a research study, within a week or two, they'll say, I just, I don't have any craving for chicken wings or steak. They, for some reason, they thought they would, they don't. Uh, and with regard to other dairy, like ice cream, they let that go pretty well too. But cheese does linger on for people. And the way to make it linger on and torture you the longest is to jump in and have little bits of it here and there. The reason I say that is there are some people who say all things in moderation, you know, don't be so strict. When people do that, they're rekindling their desire. It's like a person trying to, to give up smoking who lights up every three or four days. They, it's just this constant struggle. You can never get it out of your head. And when people get away from these things, they, they do really well. I got to tell you, Chuck, um, in many of our studies, we talk about, um, so, well, we do something that we don't do in our other studies um, where we're always health oriented. When people find out what the animals go through to make uh, milk and to make cheese, for some people, that is what grosses them out so much that they don't want to have it anymore. And, and the reason I'm mentioning that to you now is just for people who are thinking, I need a little extra boost to help me to break up with cheese. Um, once people look under the hood at what the dairy had to do to get this to you, it's... Um, really disquieting for many people. And for a lot of folks, that's that's it for them. So, so people may want to look into that and, and we can talk about that as we have in the past. I mean, yeah, there, there are so many reasons to get the dairy out of your diet. There's no question about it. And there have been real advancements um, in, in the plant-based cheeses, right? The ones that are completely dairy-free. You talk about lingering there a moment ago. Um, I was around some vegan feta this past week and man that smells just like the original and it cleared the room you 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 always use the analogy it smells like socks it's incredible what they're <laughs> able to do um yeah so if you have somebody in your house who is not really on the dairy free train but you might want to sneak that in there at least let them try it i don't know they're not going to be able to taste the difference and certainly they're not going to be able to smell the difference whatsoever uh absolutely incredible Oh, um, you are so right. You know, we've seen this with, you know, a generation ago, the, the cheese substitutes, they kind of tasted like a, an eraser or something like that. Yeah, they were not so hot, but they have gotten better and better and better. And I will never forget this, Chuck. Um, the Tree Line Cheese Company, um, they debuted their products actually at a PCRM event. And Alec Baldwin was there and other celebrities were there. And this was on um, Long Island. And uh, the, the tree line cheeses were all there, different flavors and so forth. And I didn't have any time to taste them. So the person who, the, the person, the inventor of it, Michael Schwartz was there and he gave me some just to, to put in my pocket and take later. Um, so at the end of the evening, I left and I drove back to my hotel. And along the way, I found this tree line cheese that he had given me. And I took a little bite of it and I thought, good heavens, these, um, the, the non-dairy cheeses have just advanced so far that people pick them because they're healthier and they taste great and people just don't look for the dairy ones anymore. 
Now, people might make them because they want to be compassionate or they want to be healthy or whatever, but they have really won this taste, <laughs> this taste battle finally. The, the non-dairy cheeses are terrific. And it's amazing the variety, the selection that's out there. I mean, just thinking back, you know, six years before I went plant-based to just the few that were out then versus you go now and it, like you can literally find like half of the cheese aisle is taken up now with non-dairy options. It's of every variety. Like you can think of feta, cheddar, Colby Jack, like whatever it is that's your pleasure. I mean, that's available to you in a non-dairy option. As you said, advancements. I mean, it's, it's just, I don't know how they do it but i will i will definitely tip my hat to them no um, do read do read the label though um, oh yeah like, oh like, yeah let's say they make them from pureed cashews fine healthy um in some cases they add coconut oil to them take those ones and throw them away um the coconut oil is going to raise your cholesterol and it's unhealthy but you'll find many many vegan brands that don't use the coconut or palm oils at all and they're they're a much better thing and when your guests come over and you're trying to seduce their taste buds with this wonderful vegan food you'll you'll find lots of options for them and that sounds like that's a good rule of thumb no matter what the food is is always just flip it over and look at the nutrition label right exactly um and we've talked a lot about what should be on that label but if it's plant-based foods and you're way ahead of the game but the coconut oil and the palm oil have been sneaking in and we're trying to push them out because they're just very, very high in saturated fat, unlike unlike the other plant oils that are much healthier. As long as we're talking about oil, let's take a question from Chitra, who is wondering whether olive oil is a healthier option than avocado oil. Ah, great question. You know, in recent years, you didn't, or not, not that long ago, you didn't see much avocado oil. It's coming into the market a lot more now. And nutritionally, they are almost identical, which means unlike, say, corn oil, uh, which is very heavy in the, the polyunsaturates, which are fine. Um, olive oil has a lot of monounsaturate. It's good. It's not going to raise your cholesterol. And avocado oil is almost identical to it. Um, it's very high in monounsaturates. It's going to be easy on your cholesterol level. Uh, I want to say hi to uh, Prester. I want to say hi to John, to Shelly, and uh, Charles. Charles uh, just dropped a nice comment in there for us. Uh, Dr. Barnard says, uh, great show. Been watching now for years. Been plant-based uh, for a year and a half. I live in Crystal Lake, California. Get this, 62 years young, just biked up Crystal Lake, says, thank you, thank you, thank you. 62, probably never thought in a million years they'd be able to go out and do like some serious biking after 60, but here's Charles peddling right away. That's some great news, huh? Absolutely. I mean, age 62 is just on the tail end of adolescence. So you, you've, got, you, you've, got a, you've got a whole lot left, left uh, ahead of you. I love it. If, if 62 is on the tail end of adolescence, like when does one graduate <laughs> just beyond that to adulthood? Chuck, I'll let you know. <laughs> oh man that's a good one uh all right uh we have a lot of people now talking in the chat room today also about uh anemia and getting enough iron eating a plant-based diet uh richard at 1224 all caps so you know he's serious iron deficiency suggestions please and thank you says that he loves us with a bunch of emojis thank you so much richard uh what advice can you give here dr barnard okay first of all work with your doctor make sure this is what you have um for some people, they say, I must be deficient in iron because I'm tired or I look a little anemic or I'm stressed. Just, there, there's a whole lot of reasons to be tired that have nothing to do with what's in your blood. So do see your doctor. It is a very easy thing for the doctor to diagnose iron deficiency. Let the doctor go through that. If you are anemic, if your blood uh, count is low, there are reasons other than iron deficiency uh, why that might occur. Um, so before you're thinking, well, gee, I need to have a uh, some calves liver to, to get my iron up, your doctor is going to be thinking something completely different. Here's what goes through your doctor's mind. Your doctor does the tests and says, gee, you really are low in iron. You are actually anemic. The doctor says, I want to first know if you are bleeding somewhere. And the doctor says, I want you to have a colonoscopy. And you're thinking, gee, I'm not really worried about that. Your doctor is. Because if you have occult blood loss and you're losing blood for that reason, you can be taking iron pills all day long. You're not going to solve the biggest worry, which is that you've got something harmful that needs to get addressed right away. So do all of that. If then at the end of the day, you're not bleeding, you're otherwise healthy, but for some reason you're low in iron, at that point, your doctor and your dietitian or whomever you're talking to is going to think, how the heck did you get low in iron? Because there is so much iron in green vegetables, in beans, you almost have to be working at it to get low in iron. Now, 
I, I don't want to be too glib about it. You should intentionally have green leafy vegetables as part of your diet. Some people will say add a vitamin C rich food like peppers or other fruits because they enhance the iron absorption. That's all good. Um, if you still are consuming dairy, throw that away. Uh, a glass of milk at mealtime will cut your iron absorption by 50%. Don't do that. And um, from then on, um, iron deficiency in, in anemia should be, it, it is not and should not be any more common in a person on a plant-based diet than a person who's eating meat. So there you go. Yeah. Matter of fact, we have a comment from Elizabeth who said, uh, look, I had chronic anemia since I was a teenager and the doctors kept telling me to eat steak, but the anemia actually didn't go away until she became 100% uh, plant-based at the age of 55. Still in adolescence, right. apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. You know, the, people think of have dairy for this and doctors are pushing dairy products, or, or at least they used to. Big mistake, because in addition to all the other issues that dairy will raise. One is that it is a really bad inhibitor of iron. So the, the kid following the school room advice has meat for protein and iron, and then the glass of milk for calcium. The glass of milk stops the absorption of the iron in the meat. So um, no, the, the glass of milk is, you know, is, is going to be a big problem when people go vegan. If you've got plenty of green leafy vegetables and beans in your routine, you've got good, good iron sources there. All right, let's let's uh, let's talk about that tail end of adolescence here a little bit. Uh, Roxanne is excited, still there at the tail end. She just turned 60, uh, but she's worried about her skin becoming a little bit thinner, a little bit more, I don't know, frail, for lack of a better word. Wants to know, what can you do to keep your skin healthy after the age of 60? Okay, well, the first thing that I'm going to mention is something you already know, and um, your friends have probably been telling you about this. Do be careful about the sun. Um, and this is really a lifelong thing. Sunlight has ultraviolet B, which hits the skin and does a good thing. It makes vitamin D in your, in your skin. That's the way the system is set up. But that very same ultraviolet B can damage your skin cells. It can turn them into cancer cells. It can also just accelerate the wrinkling, which is why if you hang out at a golf course and look at the golf pros who haven't been wearing their sunscreen, and they've got really leathery, very, very seriously damaged skin. So whatever damage has been done is not going to be reversed. But um, you got a lot of years left, and now is the time when your skin's delicate. So protect it against the, the sun. That means when you go out, do wear um, a, a sunscreen. And that also means you are now blocking the UVB that your body was going to use to make vitamin D. So you can get your vitamin D orally in in a, a supplement, which is usually a pretty good compromise or have a little bit of sunlight, but then put on that, that sunscreen so you're not really damaging yourself. Okay, beyond that, um, you do wanna, of course, think about antioxidants that should be part of your, your routine and it will protect you anyway. I don't mean antioxidant pills from the supplement aisle at the store, I mean the ones in your foods. So the famous ones are beta carotene, which is what makes carrots orange, Lycopene, that's what makes tomatoes red. It's also in watermelon, pink grapefruit. The anthocyanins, this will not be on the test, but anthocyanins are what make blueberries and grapes, that deep kind of purplish color. If these are part of your routine, those antioxidants that were designed to protect the carrot and protect the tomato and protect the, the grape, they will also hopefully protect you. And then let's go back to where we started. We were talking about nuts at the beginning. And nuts do have this one real benefit of providing vitamin E. And if you have just that one ounce of nuts or seeds, you'll get, oh, I don't know, five milligrams or so of vitamin E, which goes a long way toward meeting your daily requirement. And some of that vitamin E is gonna get in the skin. And of course, you can also apply topicals, which are more than happy to provide all kinds of, uh, of uh, things externally to your skin. You put those together and you've probably got the best regimen you could get. All right, let's uh, grab a few more here before we wrap things up for the day. Uh, let's start with a question from Sharon. Uh, Sharon is 77, does not like beans, though. Wants to know, is there any alternatives that she may want to give a try to? Or should somebody really make sure that they get those beans in their diet some way, somehow? Beans are optional. But if they haven't agreed with you, let's first think about why. Um, if it's that you just don't like the taste, you might think of different varieties. The bean group has its cousins, the, the honorary other beans in the legume group, 
lentils. So a big bowl of lentil soup. Got all the same benefits that, that beans would have. Uh, peas are also in that group. So beans, peas, lentils, all very similar uh, nutritionally. High in protein, high in soluble fiber, that's great. So if the taste was an issue, you might try them made different ways and try different varieties. If the issue is that you know, just never had them prepared in a way that was either flavorful or digestible, rule of thumb is there should be no al dente beans. Yeah, al dente is fine for pasta, but if your beans are not thoroughly cooked until they are soft, they're going to be indigestible and they're going to cause gassiness and make you never want to have them again. Um, so uh, make sure that your beans are cooked. If you're buying canned beans for convenience, you'll discover that different brands have a different cooking duration. Some of them, you open the chickpeas or the black beans and they're hard as rocks. Don't buy those again. Um, get the ones that are softer or just make them from scratch. Um, put them in a, uh, you can either just cook them in a pot or you can cook them in your um, instant pot or, or other pressure cooker and cook them up until they're really, really nice and soft. Separate them into batches, have them with some salsa and you're, you're going to come to love them. That sounds darn tasty, my friend. And mm -hmm. it's a, it's lunch hour too. Keep on talking. Keep on talking. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, Chuck, I was really allergic to cooking beans from scratch because it's, you know, you look at the direction, it says soak them overnight and then cook them for an hour, hour and a half. And I thought, who's got time? But I made a discovery, Chuck. I discovered they soak themselves. You don't have to actually watch them do it. So you... <laughs> And before you go to sleep, put them in the pot with some water and just let them do their thing. You don't have to be involved at all. And then the next morning, when you change the water and put them in the, the pot and cook them for an hour, an hour and a half or whatever, they cook themselves too. You don't have to be involved. And then once they're done, you can either separate them into batches or what I do is I have one of these um, immersion blenders. You know, these little things, that kind of thing. Um, I'll blend my black beans and then I'll put them into little... Um, tubs and freeze them and into portions. And so you can bring them to work. You stick it in the microwave and um, you'll have your black beans with some bread or some fat free chips or something like that and some salsa. And it's, it's uh, like a trip to Cancun. <laughs> <laughs> well played, my friend. And that is very good to keep in mind as the winter months approach. Uh, all right. Penultimate question, Marie, uh, great timing on this because I believe there was a study that was just released talking all about it. Uh, she is wondering how does eating meat increase the risk of developing diabetes? First of all, it does. Um, this is really important because people think they got diabetes from sugar. Not true. Um, that's an, a myth. Uh, sugar is not necessarily health food, but it is not the driver of diabetes. What happens is that any fatty food, but meat is a very fatty food. The fat from meat gets into your muscle cells and into your liver cells, as we were describing earlier. And the more it builds up, the more the cell becomes insulin resistant. And that just means that the insulin molecule comes from the pancreas, parks on the surface of the cell, and it's trying to open that cell membrane to let glucose inside, but the cell is filled with fat particles and the cell will not open up. The sugar can't get inside. And so the meat, because it's a staple for a lot of people's diets, is one of the biggest contributors to type two diabetes over time. What this means is that kids who are 15, 16, 17 years of age can already have the beginnings of insulin resistance, unless their well-meaning parents said, kids, we're going vegan as of today. At that point, the risk of uh, diabetes goes way, way, way down. The, the risk of insulin resistance goes down. And, and that's a, a really protective uh, step to take. All right. And the final question today comes in uh, from Inho at 1222. Now, uh, let me preface by saying let's just go ahead and slash this to a 2000 calorie a day diet. I don't know uh, what Inho's uh, workout routine is, but they're eating 3000 calories a day. But nonetheless, I think that the principles here will apply for all. So the question is this, Dr. Barnard. Uh, Inho writes, I'm a big fan. I've been dividing my daily 3000 calories equally into the four food groups, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, but have been eating the same rice burrito every single day. Is this a good idea? So let's emphasize eating the same thing every day. It's fine. Absolutely. I mean, what you're eating is, is terrific. 3000 calories is a lot. If you're a very large person or a very active person, um, fair enough. But for your average person, they would have to run 10 miles a day. To, to knock off, to knock off um, that extra thousand calories that, that, that you got there. Um, 
but yeah, you if, if you're eating fruits and vegetables and, and uh, grains and beans, it's, you can eat the same thing every day. Now, there is something to be said for variety. And the reason is, um, the small reason is that keeps the diet interesting. But the big reason is there are some nutrients that are just marginally more in one food, marginally less um, in another food. And so variety uh, is helpful. Don't forget your vitamin B12. You need it for healthy nerves and healthy blood. And it's, it's so funny, like the average person, I think that unless you're really ingrained in nutrition, you, you still have this idea that it's really easy to run off that combo meal that you had for lunch. But if you ever Google, how long does it take to run off a Big Mac? Like you will scare yourself. You're like, there's no way I can run all that because it's like, they're telling me I got to run for 45 minutes just to do this. And that doesn't even take into account the fries that I ate with it. And if you have the milkshake on top of that, man, you're going to be running until Christmas. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a whole thing. Um, but that is all the time that we have for the doctor's mailbag today. Let's go ahead and close that up. If we did not get to your question, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. Um, Dr. Barnard, today's episode of The Exam Room Live has been brought to us, as always, by our good friends at the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund, which supports organizations just like the Physicians Committee that are carrying on the love that Greg had for animals. And one of the ways that we're doing, well, a number of ways that we're doing it is by promoting plant-based health and working to end animal abuse while also emphasizing programs that promote systemic change and also benefit people. And you can learn more right now about the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund. You see their logo right there on the screen. Learn more, hop on their website, gregoryriderfund.org. That's Gregory Ryder spelled R-E-I-T-E-R fund.org. Fantastic people. Allison and the gang there are just absolutely phenomenal. And they've been such big supporters of the Physicians Committee and the exam room for so long. And we absolutely could not do these shows without their support. I know you feel the same way, Dr. Barnard. I sure do. Greg had such a wonderful heart. Um, Allison has carried that uh, forward in such a, a beautiful way. And here at the exam room, we're educating people and inspiring them. And their coronary arteries are better off in the process, but the animals are benefiting too. So thank you. No question about it. No question about it. For today, my friends, that is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you again to you, Dr. Barnard, for being here, helping us raise our health IQs and going nuts over nuts today, man. This was a really good show. Thank you, Chuck. All right. And to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen, thank you so much for a flawless episode. And to you, exam roomies, thank you all for your kind words, your comments, all of the great, great, great questions. Keep them coming. Let's get some answers and keep raising those health IQs. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon. But until then, keep it plant-based. <laughs>